Let me say that again. <laughs> you did it, Taylor. You're right. Yeah. But you know what? Just leave that in. This is, I mean, you know, it yeah. will be the beginning of the show. Hey everyone, and welcome to episode number six of the Band Director Blueprint Podcast, led by co-host Taylor Smith and Eric Villalobos. We appreciate you for joining us today, as we have quite an episode for you. For our listeners that are new to the community, we want to provide value to current and future music educators by having our guests contribute their thoughts on building and developing music programs, new teaching techniques, and just good teaching all together. Today's guest is Dr. Anthony Mazzaferro, Director of Bands Emeritus at Fullerton College, Conductor of the Frederick Fennell Wind Ensemble at the Orange County School of the Arts, Conductor of the Orange County Wind Symphony. Dr. Mazzaferro has traveled all over the world and has been a guest clinician and conductor, bringing new insight to music education. Today, we jumped into Doc's rehearsal process and the quality of music education in the United States and Doc's three non-negotiables. Without further ado, Dr. Tony Mazzaferro. Doc, it's good to see you. It's good to see you, have you on the show. How are you doing? Doing well. Thanks, Eric. Nice to see you. Taylor, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you. Doc, what is your one minute or less... What have you done and uh, what are you doing now? What have I done? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, what, is he not, what is he not done? That's what. Yeah. <laughs> Grew up in San Francisco, went through the public school system, didn't start instrumental music till seventh grade. Uh, played tuba. That was my first instrument. It's been my only instrument. Uh, went to Lowell High School in San Francisco where I really learned a lot about music uh, from my teachers went to San Francisco State, got my bachelor's uh, in performance and education. Uh, went, my, went to Northwestern University, got my master's in instrumental conducting. In those days, they didn't differentiate between wind and orchestral conducting, so uh, we did both. Uh, then taught in the public schools for four years. It was right after Prop 13. I got laid off every year for four years and then uh, had an opportunity to go to Arizona State and work on my DMA in instrumental music. So I did that and came back to the Bay Area, taught uh, in Palo Alto in the district, uh, elementary and high school for three years. And then uh, opportunity came up to go to Fullerton College. And 29 years later, I retired from that. Currently, I'm teaching at the um, Orange County School for the Arts. I direct the Frederick Fennell Wind Ensemble. And I also conduct the Orange County Wind Symphony, which is an adult ensemble. And I play tuba in the La Mirada Symphony, Symphony Irvine, um, Dana Point Symphony. That's it, one minute or less. <laughs> yeah, right. Cool. Um, one of the things that um, I do appreciate from you learning from you is that the passion that you have when you teach well and, we're italian uh, we invented passion and that's funny, right but <laughs> what the french may think yeah if it has a vowel at the end then it's probably italian yeah, <laughs> yeah so uh where did your passion originate your passion for teaching where did that originate well a lot of my um teachers that i had early on were very passionate conductors and musicians um my first teacher in junior high, Doug Pleasure, was a very passionate musician. He was in the Sixth Army Band and at the Presidio in San Francisco. Yeah. Um, he left after my first year, and he got called up to active duty uh, during Vietnam. Oh, wow. And then um, my teachers in high school, uh, Jack Pereira, was uh, a fantastic conductor and teacher and performer. He was a percussionist. Played extra with the uh, San Francisco Symphony when they needed extra percussion. So, uh, and my band director uh, was Paul Satilla, who was a fantastic trumpet player, conductor, and teacher. So those are the people that I really learned a lot about passionate music making 
during my, uh, I guess, secondary education. Uh, but then I went to the Casadero Music Camp when I was 15. And there uh, we had, uh, gosh, different conductors every week uh, for eight weeks. So we got to see a lot of people with different perspectives on teaching and conducting and the way they presented themselves musically and passionately about what they were doing. Uh, Terry Suma was probably the most comprehensive musician that I encountered in my young life. Terry was a saxophone player and conductor and jazz educator. I mean, he really is a legend in California in terms of teaching and performing. You know, Bob Ludd, who was the camp director. Um, Charlene Lusk was the first woman conductor I ever had at the music camp. And so, you know, she was passionate about it. And, uh, you know, that's where I gained a lot of it. One of the things that I also... Uh, it still takes me back every time your time at Northwestern when you were studying under uh, Painter, but you yeah. were also able to study under uh, Arnold Jacobs while you were doing yeah. that. And um, a lot of the concepts, well, and then also Parentoni at ASU, but m more so with uh, Arnold Jacobs, like, did that help you kind of refine the way of your teaching? Did that help like, uh, or just really focus on more the aspect of tuba or was it overall, I guess? Look, I didn't even know where Northwestern was. And uh, real, real quick, I was finishing my undergrad and I knew I wanted to go and get a master's degree. And so I asked my professor at uh, San Francisco State, Ed Cruz, the band director, I said, well, you know, really thinking about getting a master's, where, where are some schools I should apply? He says, well, you're going to go to Northwestern. I said, oh, okay, great. Where is it? I, mean, I literally did not know where it was. And so I wrote to the school and they, you know, two weeks later, you get a packet of materials and you, uh, you, you fill them out by hand. And anyway, long story short, I went and auditioned uh, and got in. The, the first real, I guess, life-changing moment was the first time I heard the Chicago Symphony play live. You know, to hear them play on a uh, symphony broadcast is one thing, but to be in orchestral hall and hear that sound come at you uh, was like nothing I ever heard before. And it was the uh, first concert I ever heard was Mahler's Sixth Symphony with Claudio Abbado conducting. So I'd never seen anybody memorize a score that complex before. And then I'd never heard orchestral playing like that before. In fact, I went back standing room the next night because I couldn't believe that human beings could be that perfect two days in a row. And sure enough, they were. A very valuable lesson in learning what, what really good is and great performance. Uh, Mr. Jacobs' lessons were mostly about music, not so much about playing the tuba, but becoming a great musician through the instrument that you play. And in this case, it just happened to be tuba. So he talked a lot about, well, like the book, Song and Wind. You know, you have to sing through your instrument. And being Italian, you know, we invented opera. We invented bel canto, beautiful singing style. We, um, we got along great because of that. You know, it wasn't like he had to teach me that concept. With uh, your philosophy of teaching, um, how is your teaching philosophy that has changed over the years? Like from day, year, day one, year one, to oh, well, 29 years at Fullerton College. <laughs> I'm not, I don't think the philosophy changes so much because the philosophy is what you are and what you believe. You know, and then what changes is maybe your approach to it or the addition of knowledge which reinforces your philosophy. I think those things change. But if we're, if we're to understand that the basic philosophy of music is it, it's, and music education is it's, the education of feeling, then we need to come up with various ways to teach how to feel the passion of, of what they're doing musically. You know, my philosophy is pretty simple. I love music. I love kids. I love teaching kids music. I like that one. I'm going to steal that one. Of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What was... And let me I say guess, something about the, if yeah. I can, about the philosophy thing. I, I, and I understand why we have to do it uh, when we compare music to other things, like math and science mm -hmm. will improve test scores but you know we have to be able to defend what we do based on what it is we do you know music alone 
not, not comparing it to any other subjects. That's great for administrators and parents, but at some point we have to be able to stand on our own as a valuable facet of education. Yeah, and it's just important to students because. Right. You know, and I, I agree. I just feel like uh, at least through undergrad, they really expressed how, you know, it's now part of the curriculum. It's its own subject, but I still feel like we're still trying to justify how important it is. Well, and, yeah. I mean, and look, people will always say it's an expensive uh, class to teach. Mm -hmm. And it is. I mean, you don't have to buy, you know, $8,000 Barry saxophones for a kid in an English class. Mm -hmm. But, you know, music education is much more than just band. And I think if more, you know, music teachers looked at the overall breadth of teaching music, then perhaps that would uh, give us a little better standing. Because mm -hmm. yeah, right now we're functional. You know, we play, we have marching band for the football games. But what happens if there's no football? You know, now what's the justification for our existence? You know, it has to be based on something more than eight minutes a semester, eight minutes in the fall semester. Right. But that's just my, you know, yeah. just a retired band director. You kids get off my lawn. You know? Oh, geez. <laughs> yeah, there was one uh, Zoom session that I sat in and they were really trying to push for, just because of what our current situation with COVID is, you yeah. know, trying to figure out a way to push more, keeping the marching man going if there is no football. And then the other half was explaining that, you know, we could still be sufficient by just creating chamber music. And uh, to their credit, they're both right, but at the same time, it's just like, <laughs> you know, if we stick to one medium, I think we're digging ourselves into a hole in that regard. Well, I think anytime, I mean, you know, anytime you justify your existence as a, as a, as a subject matter based on one particular thing, uh, that's going to be an issue when that goes away. All you have to look at is Hawaii and tourism to see what, you know, how the one thing that you depend on for your existence when that goes away can be uh, devastating. As far as, you know, you being at Fullerton College for 29 years, and that's a two-year school, what kind of advice would you have for uh, a high school student that's trying to pick a school? Would you recommend just jumping into a four-year school or jumping into a two-year school? Well, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I think a lot of it depends on the maturity of the student you know, and their ability level. A lot of, a lot of students uh, today, I don't think, are, are, are really ready to be out on their own going across the country. You know, I think that's because the parents don't give them that opportunity to be independent before they graduate from high school. Uh, now, there's a couple other factors that can come into this. One is uh, how musically ready are they? You know, a lot of students think they're ready for a four-year school, but uh, maybe musically they're not up to where a, an incoming freshman should be. In which case, then a community college with a fine music program uh, would be a great option. For one thing, you'll save a lot of money. And two, uh, the quality instruction um, is what you're after when you're trying to get better. I was pretty lucky to have uh, many students who came in at a sort of an undergraduate level that just needed some refinement on their basic skills in order to uh, transfer to the university. You know, maybe they weren't ready musically or mature maturity-wise. You know, I told every kid who ever sat down in, in the practice room P for their first lesson, if they just listen to what I'm telling you to do and do it in a systematic way, that in two years, people will be fighting over you. You know, colleges will, you know, you'll have your choice of schools, not, you know, well, I ended up here kind of thing. Specifically from your point of view as a junior college um, conductor and, and director, what was your favorite thing about those type of that type of student besides maybe working at a four-year college that t that type of student maybe a more conservatory conservatory minded well you know i i, I taught it at, at cal poly pomona uh, as an adjunct i did the band for several years there uh, two bands the concert band and the wind ensemble as well as teaching at fullerton so i got to see the perspective on on you know, both sides um with regard to fullerton it was always the joy of seeing them really get to where they said they wanted to be when they walked in the door. I want to be a performance major. Okay, here's what you're going to have to do. 
I want to be a music educator. Okay, here's what here are things you need to take care of before you transfer, so that when you do transfer, you can fit right into the program that's happening. That was always what I enjoyed seeing. Yeah, I, I um, had you know went through the the community college route as well before right. going to Cal, um, to a Cal State four year uh, conservatory school so, school of music, and I some of the main differences I guess was just ob- the obvious talent. I mean there was a lot of talent at the junior college level. Um, but there was also a, a lot of talent from a broader, like a bigger net of people uh, from around the world, from around the country that came. So you're seeing a different perspective of, of areas of the country, meeting people from different states and those who've already done their uh, undergrad and are doing their you know, graduate now and, and they're intermingled with you. So I think that community of four-year colleges for music is really, really enlightening, but I would never have traded anything for the four years that I had an undergrad. Um, I'm sorry, my uh, junior college experience, sure. because that, that set me up to where I am today. And, um, and the best part, I guess, would be the amount of networking that I was able to do and community I was able to build set me up for success for the four-year um, experience and to really capitalize on that time because – I think it's a culture shock your first first year in a four year college, um, and so you might lose some ground. You might have to play catch up the second third year. I was I felt like I was ready to run, you know, my first year and ready to go. So that's that's a different perspective, but yeah. And uh, I think a lot of times when you have a freshman coming into a four year school, they're going to hear some of the seniors, juniors and seniors, and, and graduate students, and just totally freak out. You know, like I can't I can't play as well as these people. Well, that's that's the goal to get to that point. But students who came in with a plan, knowing what they wanted to do and how they wanted to achieve it, always had more success than the student who said, well, I think I want to try being a music major, you know, because it's more than just playing their instrument, which they enjoyed in high school. But when you start talking about theory and ear training and music history, you know, all the, all the subjects that you're going to have to encounter to finish a degree, then uh, that's a different story. I felt like there was more opportunity at, the, at Fullerton, uh, just in two-year school in general, you know, just because I've, and it, this, it sounds bad. Um, I was able to fail and I failed a lot <laughs> at Fullerton, but um, I, I learned from that. I definitely learned from that. And uh, I felt like if I was at a four-year school, just writing, jumping at a, uh, at a high school, I think it would be a completely different route. Um, and that's what I appreciate being at Fullerton, just being able to have the opportunity to do a lot of things there. Um, granted, um, <clears throat> I took the <clears throat> six-year plan, but uh, I think that was important for me to figure things out at the same time. It all worked out eventually, but I think the, the, what I'm trying to get at is it, there was more opportunity for uh, a young musician to kind of uh, grow. Right, right. Well, you know, the, these four and six-year plans, I think... Mean, One of the things that the community college system has done over the last, and they they were working on it uh, right before I left, was developing uh, plans of study and courses of study so that, you know, the student wouldn't wander around for years. You know, it's like, here's what you need to take to get out of here in two years or three years, depending on your work situation or whatever. You know, that's, but, you know, it's also a place where you can change majors or, you know, I had, I had one student who started out as a trombone major, went to piano, and then came back and was euphonium major. What this kind of brings up, Eric, is if you don't mind, we I'd like to go and talk about like the state of music education and culture right now, um, definitely, and the and the quality of teaching that's going on um, around the world. Uh, Tony, you've been literally around the world, and you've seen yeah. dozens of ensembles and con- guest conductor and award winners. Um, how do you compare American music education? quality to maybe those from around the world that you've, that you've witnessed? Wow. Well, most of my experience has been in uh, countries in the Pacific Rim. And I guess America has high standards. But when you're talking about the respect that teachers get, I think that's number one, huge difference. And how do you, how do you mean can you elaborate uh, on that? Teachers are respected in other cultures that I've encountered, Singapore especially, Australia, New Zealand, so that there's there's a uh, understanding that when you walk into a classroom that you're going to pay attention and you're going to be totally focused on what you're doing. I think in America, we tend to want kids to have an experience. And if it's a good experience, great. If it's not, well, that's okay too. They had the experience. 
Whereas in the cultures that I've encountered, it's if we're going to do this, it's going to be at the highest level we can we can achieve. And so they do that. I mean, one yeah. time I was conducting a group in uh, Singapore. We were working on Hounds of Spring. And I suggested to the phonium bassoon and um, English horn or tenor sax player, sorry, that they work on their melodic line that they had in the middle section uh, before the next rehearsal. Well, they worked on it at the next 15 minute break and then came over and got me to prove to me that they had worked on it and wanted to play it for me before we went back into our rehearsal again. So it's just that that attention to detail and that uh, understanding that it's critically important to do it as well as you can that I think it would it would it would help American education a lot if we did that if we demanded that of our students so that's interesting like i'm if the if the ensemble i think a lot of people can be on one side or the other they can be thinking that their ensemble doesn't sound good or they can be you know well that that's a, that's a whole other issue i mean now we're talking about what does a teacher have to know and be able to do? You know, and I would I would suggest that anybody going into music education has to has to be able to know how you obtain a good sound on every instrument, and then how can you teach a child that, and then what exercises can you provide them in order to help them achieve that that uh, sound that you're looking for? You know, I mean, when I was growing up, we had one recording of the whole first suite, one. So. You know, for a kid not to know how a band is supposed to sound or their instrument is supposed to sound now, that's, they can't even say that. You know, I mean, it's there for them to just grab onto. I get this. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a lot more teaching the standards, which we didn't have when I was learning to be a teacher. Uh, there's a lot more attention on uh, research-based education, you know, and so that's all great. But I think the bottom line is, you know, the teacher has to know how an oboe is supposed to sound and how you can help a student get that sound. You know, you need to have a bunch of techniques in your hip pocket that you can use to get kids to sound better. If you don't have those, it doesn't matter where you went to school or how many seminars you've attended or what books you've read. You know, if you can't explain to them and show them, help them with exercises that will do that, then uh, it's not going to happen. There, that's an uplifting statement. That's, that's, great. <laughs> no, that's great. But Eric, I want to ask our our future guests this question as well. Um, sure. So, what would be three of your non negotiables for as a new band director? Yes. Three non negotiables. Yeah. I have to see the kids every day. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Uh, I know that a lot of schools are in this block scheduling and you see them Monday for 30 minutes and then Tuesday for an hour and a half. I mean, Okay, that's fine, but you got to see them every day. Mm -hmm. I think that that's one of my non-negotiables. Uh, second is we have to have the best instruments we can put in their hands. You know, you can't get a good sound on a on a, a plastic clarinet, for example. So seeing them every day, having the best instruments you can put in in their hands, and then having um, access to, for lack of a better word, coaches or private teachers that can come in and help work with your kids. Oh, and the other thing with regard to that last one is that every kid needs to, if you want your band to have a sound that, that everybody is involved with or thinking about, then they all have to study with the same teacher. I think that's one of the things that, uh, Alfred Watkins, an incredible band director, um, you know, the first time I heard his band at the Midwest Clinic, uh, they all, all the flutes study with the same teacher, all the clarinets study with the same teachers, and that's how they were able to get that homogeneous sound. So those would be my... That makes perfect sense. Negotiables. Uh, yeah, I, I really love that. And everybody, and I believe this, and I kind of have built this, I guess, a model from a, uh, a, a recent Grammy Music Educator winner, uh, Mickey Smith Jr. He's a middle school band director in Louisiana. And By the way, the middle school band directors and those that teach beginning instruments go straight to heaven. Yeah, and general music, <laughs> yes. right? Yeah. You know, and bad music teachers, bad music teachers come back in the next life as rental instruments for beginners. <laughs> hey, you know, I, I realized, end up a rental. I realized that one day when I was getting ready to go teach my elementary band, and uh, this kid is chomping on Doritos and 
downing a coat before he goes to play his trombone. And I thought, you know, that's what's going to happen to bad music teachers right there. They're going to come back as a rental instrument. And you're going to be filled with hot Cheetos and Cheerios. And yeah, I mean, clarinets and reeds aren't changed and it's Thanksgiving, you know, that kind of thing. Well, this leads me to asking, uh, I believe every student has their own individual sound and not just on their instrument, but their, how they move through life, you know, yeah. and, and every teacher has its own, has its own sound. So I'm curious, uh, Tony, what's your sound? How did you develop your sound? Oh, wow. Uh, the first really great tuba player I heard was uh, Floyd Cooley, who was a tubist in the San Francisco Symphony. He has an album, oh, listen to the old person talk, the album uh, called The Romantic Tuba, where he plays songs of Schumann. And uh, it's just one of the most beautiful tuba sounds that I ever heard. You know, and then, of course, in Chicago, Mr. Jacob sound and Arizona State, Mr. Parentoni sound. Uh, all of those things contribute to how I think about the sound of my instrument. You know, and I, 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 I've, I've always stressed tone quality because that's the first thing that, to me, that captivates a listener. You know, you can have the greatest technique in the world, but if you sound like Elmer Fudd playing a, a euphonium, then no one's going to care. So to me, it's always about sound first. <clears throat> and then also getting air through the horn. <laughs> well, yeah, both lips, both lungs is always a good way to go. Yeah, absolutely. There was a rumor that Arnold Jacobs had one lung. Is that true or no? Uh, no. He, okay, he, I thought so. Uh, so this is part well, of the show. I'm young and good looking too, so you know. Keep <laughs> anyway, right. Uh, this is part of the show where we ask a random question, kind of like oh, random questions. Oh, those are yeah, always yeah. Fun. You're a Giants fan. I am. I am a Dodgers I fan. Giants fan. Well, what, you what's can get therapy for that, Eric? <laughs> <laughs> Several people here that can help you. So now that, you know, uh, MLB is going to be uh, doing a 60-game uh, season, right? how do you think it's going to pan out between the, the Dodgers and the Giants? Well, the Giants are definitely in a rebuilding kind of uh, situation. A lot of their players that they signed to long-term contracts after the World Series in 2012 or 14, those are going to be coming due in the next year or two. So they're kind of stuck with those players until – uh, their contracts are or they're traded yeah uh, so I think they're in a rebuilding year and they will be for several years uh, I don't see them being in that kind of contention for at least three to five years but I think they'll be back I'm sure they'll be back you know as far as your Dodgers go I just wish man they just got to get over that last hump of course this whole sign stealing thing was uh, really was embarrassing and deflating for the game of baseball yeah if there's you know in anything if there's no integrity then what's the point right so it's it's funny because you say so what's the random time. question that well, was that, it that, well, that, that was <laughs> yeah no it's just i always find it funny that dodger fans you oh, you always say that dodger fans are like recovering alcoholics this is gonna they be are. The, i mean look they're <laughs> yeah but you know i'll tell you i uh christy and i went to a giants game in san francisco in 2010 they were playing the marlins you had no idea at that moment or at that point that they were going to end up, you know, headed towards a World Series. I mean, they were playing good baseball, but mm -hmm. World Series, come on. <laughs> it hadn't happened in forever. You know? so. Yeah, and I don't want to bring up the, the fact that I'm an Angels fan. Uh, <laughs> it might be a bad time. <laughs> they, hey, look, 2002, and what have they done since? <laughs> so our next question. <laughs> <laughs> well, <look. laughs> Uh, right. <laughs> uh, uh, can you talk about your rehearsal process? Like from the, the minute you walk on the podium to, you know, you say thank you and then we're done. Okay. It, even after 40 years of teaching, I still make a lesson plan for every rehearsal. And if teachers are telling you that they don't need to or they've got it figured out, I, you know, I'm just one of those people that has to write everything down. Uh, I remember things better that way. I always have. So I still make a lesson plan before every rehearsal. My philosophy about a rehearsal is sort of in, well, it's in line with Bennett Reamer's a philosophy of music education with regard to ensembles. And that's the philosophy of study, or sorry, excuse me, experience, study, re-experience. 
And, and that can apply to a piece or a section of a piece, um, but certainly there's a psychological aspect to a rehearsal too that you have to understand. Likewise with programming and concert and then where you place pieces in a concert. Always start with warm ups, long tones, chorales. I mean, I think it's important to get the kids physically ready to play their instruments. You know, I, 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 we do some breathing exercises uh, based on the chorales. And then we do a couple of uh, technical exercises. And then we get right into a piece that they're familiar with because psychologically you want the kids to have a lot of confidence about what they're doing when they start a rehearsal. So we'll do that. And then the second piece will be a piece that needs some work, but not as much work. Take a section of that. And then the third piece is always the one for me that you're going to spend the majority of time on. And that's the one that needs the most attention, the most detailed work, the most sectional work. And then we would finish the rehearsal by doing something that, that they're familiar with or can play confidently. So that I like my rehearsals to start with students being confident and then ending with confidence. We make them want to come back, you know, and then coming back and doing it again so they can hear the progress and the growth of what they're doing and how this kind of rehearsing makes them better. And then I'm all for that. And that's how I've always approached it. Now, that's a, that's a blueprint. That doesn't mean it happens every time. Right. You know, I've always said that teachers need to go into a rehearsal room with their A, B, C, and possibly D plan. I was going to work on the oboe section today. Oh, the oboe players uh, in juvenile hall. Okay, well, let's see. What can we do now? Not that that's ever happened to me. And now, so since that you've done a lot of clinics at different groups, um, uh, how does that experience with the conducting and clinicking those groups around the world, um, how does that affect your approach in teaching with the current ensembles? Uh, well, when you're doing a clinic, it's usually an hour to an hour and a half, and that's the only time you're ever going to see them. So you really try and give them as much information as you can, which will allow them to become a better ensemble. What, what is the big issue? You know, when you're listening to an ensemble, is it, is it tone quality? Is it intonation? Is it articulation? Is it rhythm? What's, what's the real issue? And then you attack that issue and say, well, here are some things you might want to try in order to resolve some of those issues. You know, when you have your own ensemble, you certainly, you know, have a luxury of time to work on everything, not just what their main issue is. So I'm not sure it's, it's any different. It's just you got a longer period of time with your own ensemble to work on things than you do with a group that's just come in for an hour and a half for that, for that particular day. So, so kind of going back to rehearsal process, because I think sure. that's going to be a key point of this, this whole interview, is how you establish that. Now, how do you, do you structure your concert specifically, in, in a, sorry, in a specific way, where you always start a concert with this type of tune, you end, you end your set with this? Like, is there a structure to that, or do you kind of just play what's on your mind, or well, how does that work out? You know, I think students, well, a lot of musicians talk about stage fright, or their nerves, they are nervous before they play, or you know, when they're going out on stage. At some point, you just don't care anymore. You say, look, I'm gonna play and <laughs> here it is. You know, but when you're, you know, when you're 15 or 16 and your adrenal glands are in overdrive, uh, that's not an easy attitude <laughs> to just comprehend. So I think uh, I always start with something that everybody can play well. You know, from the last chair trumpet to the last chair clarinet, so that they start the concert with confidence. Uh, the most difficult piece comes third for me, because that way, you know, the kids are focused, uh, the audience is focused. You know, I certainly wouldn't put the most difficult piece at the end. I kind of structure it the way a, a classical period symphony would be, where the most intricate uh, intellectual parts are in the beginning, and then as you get towards the end, it's more user-friendly, for lack of a better word. You know, Mozart had it figured out. You know, he was the ultimate musician who could take an audience with him through an entire concert. I, I really like how you said, like, you know, the most challenging piece is on the third piece. Yeah. And that's kind of like the natural, you want to create an arc throughout your performance, I think. Well, it's not so much an arc, but just the fact that, I, I guess, yeah, I guess you could say that. But for me, it's, okay, the first piece, they're all confident about what they're playing. Second piece... You know, they're building more confidence. And now we get to the piece that really is going to be the most challenging for them. 
and they're ready for it. I wouldn't start off with theme and variations of Schoenberg, that's for darn sure. Hi, everybody, welcome to the concert. I know um, some some band directors usually always end their concert with a march. Okay, I, 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 I agree with that. That's, uh, that's our heritage and that's our, uh, that's where we came from. You know, I know that a lot of band directors don't like marches because they're not very esoteric, you know, for lack of a better word, but uh, Roger Rickson, who was the band director at RCC before Kevin uh, and I were old friends and uh, he always said marches are music too. You know, so it all depends on how you approach them. I just want to, first of all, thank you, Tony, again, and for your incredible knowledge and experience that you're bringing to our audience um, and what you've done for music education as a whole. I think, I think uh, too often we don't appreciate those who should be appreciated. And so um, I want to just take this moment for on behalf of all of us that are listening. Thank you for everything you've done and how, how much that means to, to the next generation of music educators and musicians to be able to have a model like yourself to be able to follow. And so thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all you've done. I appreciate that. I do have one more thing. Uh, one of the things that, are you guys familiar with the, uh, the website, the Composer's Date Book? No, actually. It is a NPR site. Uh, it's called Composer's Date Book. And when you go on the website, on the left-hand side, they have radio. And if you scroll down on the left-hand side, they have all these different listening stations. And they have one of concert band music that runs 24 seven. I had no idea. Yeah, and you'll hear everything from Angels in the Architecture to Sousa March, followed by Lincolnshire Posey, <laughs> followed by the latest John Mackey piece. It's pretty cool. And they just added it. They never used to have it. And so they added a channel now that's just 24 seven band music. And that quality music constantly is what builds your sound, I think, as an educator. Well, and if, you, if you're trying to find new things or things you haven't heard before, it's a great place to do it for, for, for free, man, for free. Uh, Doc, what are you reading? What am I reading? Mm -hmm. Well, I've been reading a ton since this <laughs> pandemic thing started. What was the most enlightening thing you've read in the last couple months? Uh, Daniel Leviton is an author. He's written several books. Uh, this is Your Brain on Music, The World in Six Songs. Uh, the latest book of his I wrote, uh, wrote read, uh, was A Field Guide to Lies. And basically he talks about how statistics are used to justify any argument you want to make. How we as a people should be more aware of how statistics are used to uh, manipulate us in our way of thinking. Awesome. I'd actually like to ask you, what would be a conducting book that you would recommend for, for newer conductors? Oh, uh, uh, I, just, I, just, I just got the Conductor's Challenge by Frank Battisti. Uh, but the, the book that I uh, that would give young conductors some insight is uh, by Mark Wigglesworth. It's called The Silent Musician, Why Conducting Matters. We will have those resources on our website at uh, banddirectorblueprint.com for you to check out. Yeah. Well, listen, thanks for having me, Taylor. It's oh. a to meet you. Maybe someday I can come work with your kids at your school now that you've heard so much about me. <laughs> that would be okay. an honor. Because being retired, you know, I'm just like uh, waiting to read the box scores of baseball games and, uh, you know, walking the dog. That's about it. Too many, too many times uh, band directors are scared to invite people into their room and to hear their ensembles and work with their ensembles for multiple purposes. It could be, uh, we talk about ego, we could talk about um, they don't believe in... Oh, you, could, you could stop right there at ego. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. How, do, how do you get, how do you let that guard down to invite people like yourself and, and build that community into your en ense ensembles? Eric does it really well, um, but I'm curious, from your perspective, how many... Do you wish it was more often that they would reach out to you and include you into? Well, I mean, it's not just about including me, but the, but the whole idea of, of having another set of ears come in and listen to your kids, you know, they'll hear things you haven't heard before or, or as a teacher are willing to let go by because you know the kids.
when you have somebody else come in, it's like, okay, here's what I'm hearing. Here's what I think we should do. You know, it's like getting a second opinion from a doctor on a diagnosis. I mean, I, 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 like, I like teaching and I like being around students who want to learn. For me, it's like, well, let's have somebody else come in and if for nothing else, just, you know, validation of what you're telling the kids. You know, I mean, I've done a lot of clinics where the band director looks at me and just is like, thank you, because, you know, you, I've been telling them the same thing for months, and now you come in and tell them the same thing, and you don't know. Them. You know, I mean, that's validation right there. I don't, that's always a good reason to have someone else come in. I think one of the things that helps is if, is if the people you have that come in that are of a college or university level have actually had some experience teaching at the secondary level. Because they get it, they understand what you what what what's going on. You know, if if you come in and start talking at an esoteric level that they can't even understand, when all you as a teacher want them to do is play their parts better, and how do we do that? You know, that's a whole different situation. I mean, I did a clinic with a local with a high school in the town that I live in, and the director had been meaning to ask me for years to come in, but he just didn't get around to it. And then he says, I wish, I wish, I wish you to come sooner. <laughs> you know, look, for me, I, you know, Eric knows this. I'll bring my tube and just sit in the back. That's true. I love that. The tube players, you know, who don't know fingering or don't know which slides to move because the slides haven't moved in 20 years, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, how do we find you, Doc? Instagram or email or? Uh, Facebook. Uh, <laughs> I've got... Uh, MySpace, I think, is that that's popular, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Sorry to break it to you. I have a Facebook account, I've got uh, Gmail. You got to understand, I, you know, for us, cassettes were a big deal back when they were, you know, 20 minutes on one side and then turn it over, you got another 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, Doc, what's your favorite drink? My favorite drink? Mm hmm. The one, I know some, you. the one somebody else is buying. Come on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, the best answer. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, you know, I used to drink a lot of diet soda, uh, just water and iced tea. That's it. You know that, Eric. I'm. I'm. I'm really oh yeah. I'm, I'm pretty boring when it comes to those kinds of things. Uh, Pete's uh, Major Dickinson's blend is my morning uh, cup of Joe around long before Starbucks. I just wanted to wake me up in the morning. You know, and, you know, I never drank until I had kids. Oh wow! All the way through grad school, both times, never touched it. <laughs> what is your blueprint for success be willing to work hard learn your craft learn everything you can about what it is you profess you want to do and then make sure that you're willing to listen to other people along the way because everybody's got a different opinion than you and if you can figure out how to take from those individuals who you uh, respect and are willing to work hard, then things will work out the way they should. Well said. Well, Doc, thanks again for being on the show. Um, it's it's been a pleasure. It. You know, you've been a great mentor of mine, and um, you know, it's it's nice to still be able to hang out and get a couple jabs of talking about the 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 Giants and Dodger, Dodgers. You know, that's always fun. Who? But yeah, yeah, the Giants, 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 and Dodgers. <laughs> Yeah. I got Sorry. her. They haven't even started the spring training in July. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I actually went for a three mile run today. And so, like, I'm starting to get cotton mouth. So, uh, yeah. So, the di Giants, I did it again. Giants <laughs> and Dodgers. <laughs> <laughs> So, but Eric, anyway, what are you drinking right now? Jesus. I was going to say, what's Just in your water? <laughs> Just water. <laughs> sure. Wow. Uh, Gosh, hey, let's do this again at three o'clock. I want to hear how lucid you are then. Right, right. Now, I'm usually <laughs> taking a nap at that time. Below 30, I mean, gosh. Uh, yeah. You know, Doc, thanks again. Um, you know, this means a lot for you to come on and, and, uh, you know talk about what you've done and talk about your philosophies so i really appreciate it well thanks for having me guys and thanks for the kind words i appreciate it absolutely all righty take care bye thanks, too. bye. <laughs> thanks you can find information on today's guest show notes book recommendations and more at our website banddirectorblueprint.com if you're not part of our facebook group yet you should be 
We are active every day, and we love engaging with you on Facebook and Instagram. We enjoy bringing you stories, insights, and especially practical concepts and ideas you can take and apply to your program or career today. So please join us and let us know who you are and who you would like to hear from next on the show. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review to help us reach more people like you. I leave you with this one question. What is your blueprint to success? Take care. Yeah. Oh, he oh, left. He left. <laughs> Dang. Okay. All right. Dude. Oh, God. What? Uh, oh, <laughs> Dude, that's what Doc does to me every fucking time. <laughs>